Hello everyone, this is The Mind of Lilith and thank you for joining me today as I take a deeper look into the most recent episode of Love and Marriage Huntsville, Season 8, Episode 10. I will not be doing a full episode recap as there are plenty of other content creators who do an excellent job covering the show. Instead, I'm going to focus on specific segments of the episode that I believe could be used as teachable moments for myself and the audience. First of all, rest in peace to Kiki. Um, when I first heard that she died, my heart got heavy because in the last several years of her life, she's been through a lot of turmoil. And I was hoping that before she passed, she got clean and made peace with her family. I prayed that her heart was not burdened by regrets or anger or fear or sorrow and you know that her family uh, finds solace with each other instead of letting this tragedy drive them further apart. A lot of older people have died in my family over the past decade and you can still feel the bitterness and resentment from the relatives who don't know how to forgive and forget and some people act like holding a grudge is a badge of honor but anyway i hope that the memorial services and the funeral is peaceful for the family um, without any drama interruptions or clout chasers who want to sensationalize the tragedy for their own personal gain and entertainment um, I'm going to start off with Martel and his conversation with Stormy. Uh, Martel finally admitted that he tried to holler at Trisha. And I'm not surprised because Martel is a cockhound, especially after his divorce. Most narcissists have anything but a hole in it syndrome. They will smash anything moving, especially if they're going through some sort of emotional turmoil. Um, they use sex to regulate their feelings. So I'm not surprised that he tried to holler at Trisha. I wonder if he was trying to smash Trisha during his marriage to Melody or after his divorce while he was still dealing with Arion. And if Trisha did sleep with him, I'm not sure if she did or not. Uh, he said she came over to his crib more than once. I don't know. I'm not going to speculate about that. It's up to her to tell her business. Um, I wonder if Ken would feel some kind of way if, you know, Trisha did smash Martel before she met him. Or even if he tried to holler at her, how would he feel about Trisha having some sort of friendship with Martel, knowing that he was attracted to her in that way? And Trisha seems like Martel's physical type. She's like bottom heavy, brown skin, slim, similar to Arion. Martel likes slim women. So, you know, Trisha is not an unattractive woman and Martel would definitely smash, especially if he smashed his manager. I forgot her name. I think her name starts with an M as well. But yeah, so I'm not surprised that Martel tried to hit on her. I wonder if Martel sent Trisha those DMs while she was still in with her husband or after they separated. You know, a couple weeks ago, Trisha was blushing and sniggling and giggling around Martel a whole lot. I don't know if it was because she's shy or naturally awkward or if she is low-key attracted to him. Martel is not an unattractive guy. He's very charming. Most narcissists are very charming. So I wonder if she's physically attracted to him and that's why she's acting a little bit weird around him. I don't know. Hopefully that situation is in the past and Martel will respect Trisha's relationship with Ken and she'll also respect her relationship with Ken. And hopefully this whole thing happened before they even got together. So anyway, Sonny and Moses are house hunting and they viewed a house that Martel built. Now, I am happy that Martel is back to building homes and being productive instead of stalking and harassing Melody. But I wasn't a fan of this house. It looked tiny and very bare bones for a growing family. In my opinion, the house that Chris showed Sonny and Moses would be better for like a bachelor or a single couple who is just starting out their relationship with no kids. Martel was agreeing with Sunny that you can't help who you fall in love with because Sunny was explaining to Martel what was happening. And you know, Destiny and Martel are relatively close according to Martel and Destiny. And Martel was being neutral in his mind only because he could relate to Sunny and Moses getting caught up in an inappropriate relationship just like he and Arion were caught up in an inappropriate relationship. So Martel was agreeing with Sunny that you can't help who you fall in love with 
as if he did not have a choice but to cheat on Melody with Arion for five years, like it was out of his hands, right? Now, as an astrologer, I do understand cosmic alignments and attracting people into your life who are meant to teach you valuable lessons about yourself. But if that was the damn case and Martel was so in love with Arion, why was he trying to holler at Trisha instead of cultivating a stronger bond with Arion after his divorce? Why was he still harassing and pining at the Melody? Why hasn't he committed to Arion yet? He hasn't even claimed her on social media. Not to say he has to, to make the relationship legitimate, but he's doing everything else on social media. He's going after Melody on social media. He's begging her for forgiveness on the show. Why can't he go on social media and basically, you know, claim Arion publicly? And like I said before, Martel's confused, so he creates confusion around him. Yes, I do believe that Sonny and Moses may be more compatible than Destiny and Moses based on where they are in their lives. But what is troublesome to me is that Moses spent like eight years in and out of jail. He was running the streets and probably rushed to get married to Sonny for stability. While Leberic, Destiny's ex-husband, is a West Point graduate who has government contracts. He's also an excellent cook with his own catering business. And to my knowledge, he has no criminal record. Why did Destiny let Leberic go so easily if it was her choice? It may not have been her choice. Why did he drop her like a hot potato with a brand new baby, considering how responsible he is in every other area of his life? Why does it seem like Destiny was more pressed or upset about Moses than Leberic? On paper and in real life, Leberic is the better catch. And he's very handsome. And he's about his business. He doesn't seem like he tolerates mess and immaturity. But apparently Destiny, like many black women in the community, who fight over men like Moses and Martel, apparently Destiny likes mess. Like, I honestly can't imagine crying over an ex-con. Not to say that Moses cannot redeem himself, and if you go to jail, that means that you are destined to be a pariah and an outcast, and, you know, you don't deserve to be in a relationship or you don't deserve love. I'm not saying that, but why would Destiny cry over an ex-con who can't take care of her who or who didn't want to take care of her while she had a whole handsome, successful, responsible, hardworking husband that she refused to give her last name to. Like, was Destiny settling for Leberic because she thought he was more financially stable, which is why Leberic just up and left her in the middle of a pandemic right after they had a baby? Like, what was happening there? That whole situation was so odd, and he probably didn't want to discuss it because he didn't want to dishonor himself or his family he seems like an honorable man but for a man to be that responsible and that methodical and diligent about managing his life in a way that is conducive to him being self-sufficient and successful and a productive citizen for him to just up and leave his wife and the mother of his only child during the pandemic the way he did it seems like there's a lot more going on with destiny than we knew about and it's not our business but i really hope that destiny did not sabotage her relationship with the barrack for the likes of moses and if she did do the barrack dirty um does she have a leg to stand on as it pertains to uh the way sunny navigated that relationship like if you're willing to throw your husband under the bus maybe i'm speculating here for some side peen, some prison peen, you weren't even loyal to your husband. Why should Sonny be loyal to you? If that was the case, because it's starting to look like maybe Destiny was inappropriate with uh, Moses while she was married to Leberic because there's overlap. You knew him for 15 years. You had a baby. And really quickly after your divorce, you, you're dating again. You're not trying to get your husband back. You're not trying to reconcile with him. You're not trying to apologize to him. It's just like cold turkey, like whatever. On to the next. That always bothered me because I felt like LeBeric was a good guy compared to the other trolls on the show. So I hope that wasn't the case. And if it was, I guess Sonny did to uh, Destiny what Destiny did to LeBeric. You know what? I can't even get mad at these men um, in the manosphere because a lot of black women in our community can't pick a good man if their life dependent on it. And sometimes that's literally. Why are Destiny and Sunny, two beautiful women, fighting over a man who has spent eight years in jail? Because he's handsome with good teeth and hair? This is why I said like two years ago, Martel will never have a problem getting another woman. He has muscles, he has teeth, and he has a bald head. A handsome man with muscles will never have an issue. 
catching a woman in the black community, regardless of his personality disorders, regardless of his criminal past, regardless of his mental health issues, regardless of the amount of money he has or the lack of money that he has, it does not make a difference. These men kind of fall upward. If you're handsome with muscles, you fall upward. You have single women in their late 30s to early 40s, desperate for a baby, desperate for the happily ever after, and now they're willing to do whatever it takes to be with any man that is relatively attractive. A man they probably couldn't get when he was young because he was out running the streets and feeling himself. And you couldn't get him when you were young either because you probably weren't ready uh, for a long-term commitment. It's like men like Martel and Moses and uh, Shirley Strawberry's ex-husband, Ernesto, they tend to fall upward. There's always a woman waiting to comfort a man with her vagina. This is how it works. And that's why these men don't have to shape up and do any better. Because again, Leberic slipped through Destiny's fingers. Why wasn't she upset about that situation? She seemed like stonewall about it, like very stoic about it. Like it was whatever, no tears or nothing. And I kind of feel like she was matter of fact about it because she had a backup, a la Moses. I hope that I'm wrong. I'm just speculating. I hope that I'm wrong, but I'm like, this situation is not really making any sense to me. You know, I don't feel bad for Destiny or Sunny. A lot of women would rather get played by a handsome fuckboy with swag than settle down with a stable, predictable, kind, but average looking man. So they get what they get. In another scene, uh, Nell is having a family meeting to discuss the family's finances. Apparently, she and Chris have been bankrolling their grown children's lives and it's preventing Chris and Nell from getting out of debt and taking care of their own business. And this is where I have to give Kimmy her props for uh, the way she raised Jalen. Not to compare the Fletcher's children with Kimmy's child, but you know, Jalen graduated college. He started working at Black and his mom hooked him up with his first condo, which he will pay for with his job at Black. If your parents are financially stable, it's best to use them as a foundation and not a crutch. And it seems like Nell is being emotionally manipulated by her children and she has only two biological grandchildren, but I saw four adults in that room. So Nell and Chris adopted their niece who felt some kind of way about Nell saying that she will only provide for her grandkids, which sounds kind of rough, but it's not fair to Chris and Nell to keep bailing out their grown children. Like if they can't manage their finances with no children, um, why don't they move back home to Chris and Nell's house? which seems big enough for a couple of them to move back into. Like they can move back home, save money, and then get a house. They're not living in a high cost living a city like Miami or Atlanta or New York or Los Angeles. Huntsville is still moderately priced compared to other cities. Why can't the two brothers get a house together? Instead of mooching off their parents, they need to practice group economics within that family. Now in the last scene, Kimmy and Maurice met with Sonny and Moses. I guess they're being broken in by the cast. Moses discussed his past life in the streets um, of St. Louis, and he feels like Huntsville is a good place to settle down and start over because St. Louis is too rough. Now, on a quick side note, or not so quick side note, I noticed that Black people, Black Americans in particular, swear by the Democratic Party. Many of us will attack people who won't vote for Joe Biden or any other uh, Democratic presidential candidate. Yet Maurice said that Detroit, a Democratic city, was too dysfunctional for him. He had to leave and go to Alabama. Kimmy, who was from Baltimore, another Democratic-run city, said the same thing, that Baltimore was a hot mess and she had to go to Alabama, which is a Republican state for the most part. Um, and now we hear Moses saying the same thing about St. Louis, which isn't really considered like the North like that, so to speak. It's kind of considered the Midwest. But a significant percentage of Black Americans live in Democratic cities like New York and Chicago and St. Louis and Atlanta and Baltimore. And we all complain about the same shit. High crime, crappy relationships, high cost of living. And then you have Black people migrating to Republican states to escape from the democratic policies that they continue to vote for. You know, for the past several days, I've been watching the Democratic Party melt down about Biden's debate and his decline in mental health. And the media, like MSNBC and CNN, they've been having these um, information sessions and these town hall meetings and these watch parties. Um, and they're speaking with 
potential voters about how they plan to vote, I noticed that all the white women who were interviewed were Democrats and all their husbands were Republicans. And so they were going to these information sessions and these meetings to like have discussions about politics that wasn't so polarized. They wanted to hear what Republicans had to say and Republicans want to hear what Democrats had to say. But I noticed that when the reporters asked the white women what their party affiliation was, they all said Democrat. And they were like, yeah, my husband isn't here. He's a Republican. We can't agree on who to vote for. And over the past several years, you know, these uh, political debates have become very contentious and non-productive. A lot of mudslinging, a lot of ad hominems, a lot of gaslighting and just immature behavior. So it's been really hard for the Democratic and Republican Party to have like productive conversations about the state of the economy, the border crisis, education, healthcare, so on and so forth, because the media has turned themselves into a weapon of mass destruction or a weapon of mass distraction. And so, yeah, when I was watching these interviews, the women were like, my husband's a Republican. The white women who vote for Democratic policies married men who had Republican ideals. Is this because a lot of the Democratic men are married to other men? <laughs> okay, it's a joke. <laughs> Or is it because men who support the Democratic Party um, and men who live in Democratic cities like Detroit and New York and Miami and Baltimore and Los Angeles aren't necessarily family oriented? I'm not saying that there are no Democratic men who have families who are married. I know a lot of men who are Democrats who are married to women and married to men too. I'm not saying that men who support the Democratic Party don't believe in marriage at all. But it seems like these white women want their cake and eat it too. They want to talk shit about Republicans and Donald Trump while reaping the benefits of being married to a conservative Republican male who believe in the traditional nuclear family, whether they're gay or not. Now, I'm not a Trumpster. I'm not a MAGA. I'm what you would call a both-sider. So I can see, you know, the bullshit on, on both sides. But over the past eight years, the media has been so obsessed about Donald Trump that they <laughs> weren't paying attention to Joe Biden's dementia. They were not paying attention to his dementia. Wrong. I think they were paying attention. I think they were hoping that we weren't paying attention. I think that the Biden um, administration promised the media that they would do whatever they can to ensure that Donald Trump does not win a re-election. And it turns out because Donald Trump has a very strong Rahu North Node aspect. He's born in the eclipse. Whatever they did backfired. <laughs> so he got more support. The media spent the past eight years basically promoting Donald Trump's second or third presidential campaign. This is his third presidential campaign. So no matter how much the media, the Democratic media, attacked Donald Trump, he grew in popularity. So it kind of backfired. This is how you know that how some people are destined to do certain things and be in certain positions because literally the entire left wing media apparatus went against Donald Trump for the past eight years. Every single day for the past eight years, they have been going against Donald Trump, saying how evil he is, how much he's a liar, he's a racist, all this stuff. There was a frenzy around him. Every single thing he said and did, they were on his ass like white on rice. I'm like, you. I've never seen this before. I've never seen this level of obsession and pettiness around the president, which means that more than likely behind the scenes, something didn't work out the way they expected. The fix could have been in. Some people are saying that Hillary Clinton told Joe Biden to stand down because Joe Biden was going to run in 2016. And Hillary Clinton actually selected Donald Trump to be her opponent, control opposition, to make her look better by comparison. But because Donald Trump was born in an eclipse <laughs> and because Hillary Clinton is a Scorpio, it didn't work out that way. Apparently, Donald Trump stole her thunder and she never forgave him for that. And now it's time to weaponize the Justice Department against him and the media against him. So, yeah, uh, the media has been so far up Donald Trump's ass the past several years that they've ignored Biden's. Uh, no, I'm not going to say ignored they didn't pay attention to it. They didn't report it because they thought that whatever Biden was going to do to sabotage uh, Donald Trump was going to work and it backfired. And now they're desperate because after Trump's conviction, after his felony conviction, because Joe Biden keeps calling him a felon, 
which had the opposite intended effect. Donald Trump broke a record when it came to campaign contributions, and he was getting contributions from like small donors. 20 bucks, 40 bucks, 10 bucks, five bucks here and here. And people were giving to his campaign generously. And these weren't big donors. So <laughs> I think the debate was the last straw for the media. As a matter of fact, I think that the media planned to turn on Joe Biden during this debate because they all were on the same accord. Just like they were all saying he was sharp as attack, he was lucid, he was sharp. You know, he was ready to go, lots of energy, just how they were lying about that. Um, and they were all in unison with that script. They're now all in unison with the script of we got to get this man out of here because Donald Trump is going to win and we can't have that happen. Whoever is controlling Biden, um, whoever is behind the scenes controlling the media, covering for Biden, they're desperate to get Trump out of office. I told you guys a few months ago, I wrote in my community section that I had a dream that I attended this black tie fundraising event in Harlem, New York. And in the dream, there were all these rich people who were all dressed to the nines, um, but they were very angry. They said, we cannot let Donald Trump get back in office. And then I yelled from the back, if you were doing your damn job, you wouldn't have to worry about him being elected in the first place. And then they escorted me out and the dream ended. But there was a group of a whole room of people who were very angry about the idea of him getting reelected. They were like they were pounding on the table. He cannot win. I don't know why they're so against him. I think Donald Trump is like the tail that wags the dog. Usually when politicians are selected by the powers that be and then we vote for who they select for us, the powers that be have control over that candidate because they chose them. But it seems like Donald Trump is like rogue. He went rogue from the very beginning and he wasn't supposed to be in there. And now he's in there like swimwear and they kind of took for granted that Biden would do whatever it took to get rid of him. So the media slept on his dementia and his senility for over three years, over four years, they slept on it. You know, it is what it is. So yeah, last point, why are white women and white men allowed to be in relationships and come together and benefit from the system regardless of their political differences? The Democratic Party tries to create division between black men and black women because black men are more attracted to the Republican conservative party. Not in a majority, not as a majority, but a significant percentage of black men are moving towards the conservative Republican party because that party aligns with their values. A lot of black men want to get married. A lot of them want to have children. A lot of them want a traditional stable, life where their wife has a certain role and they can fulfill their duties in society and a lot of women who are democrats especially black women they're not oriented that way um there is a visceral fear of trusting black men in any regard especially romantically or financially because of our history in this country so black women have a different agenda than black men right just like white women have a different agenda than white men they're still getting married though. Like white men and white men, women are still getting married. All of the people that were interviewed by these reporters, all the white people were married. So they have no problem coming together regardless of their political differences. Why is it that black women are like, well, if you vote for Republicans, I can't deal with you. You're a racist, you're a MAGA, you're a coon, all this stuff and vice versa. The same thing happens to black men who shame black women and black women, black women and black men into voting Democrat. Like you have to do that. The Democratic Party, again, tries to create division between black men and black women because black men are more conservative leaning and black men have been guilted and gaslit into thinking like black women who don't know that they're being pimped by the preacher or their political leaders. Unlike women, honestly, uh, men don't have as much tolerance for abuse and disrespect. So if something isn't working for them, whether it's a job or a relationship or a school system or some other situation, these men are more inclined to rebel or do something about it, even if it's illegal or self-destructive. So black men naturally will leave the Democratic Party before black women do, unless Kamala Harris is overlooked and stepped over as the uh, the vice president, as a presidential candidate. Then there, we may see an exodus of black women from the Democratic Party. But for the most part, black men will leave the, the Democratic Party before black women do because the Democratic Party isn't working for black men and black men have no incentive to stay invested in or um, committed to a party that does not serve their needs. It's as simple as that.
women have a higher tolerance for abuse and disrespect. And so we'll put up with being ignored, being gaslit, being looked over, being manipulated, being used for decades. And we complain about this every election cycle, but we continue to vote for the same political party. For what? I'm going to delve into this a little bit further in my next commentary, but thank you for listening. I look forward to reading your feedback. Please like, share, subscribe, and I'll speak to you soon.